So this lecture will discuss medical nutrition therapy for low birth weight infants. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this in historical context. So again, in the grand scheme of things when it comes to medical knowledge and medical treatment, so we're looking at a significant improvement in the treatment of premature infants in the last 50 years. And so now, so most premature infants have the potential for long and productive lives. And so nutrition requirements are gonna be determined based on the infant's size, age, and clinical condition. And so these patients are going to be in the neonatal intensive care unit or NICU. And so the preterm birth rate in the U.S. was 12.7% and the incidence of low birth weight was 8.2%. Now looking at some of our definitions and terms. So low birth weight is an infant who weighs less than 2,500 grams at birth. Very low birth weight is an infant who weighs less than 1,500 grams at birth. An extremely low birth weight is an infant weighing less than 1,000 grams. Now remember that 1,000 grams is a kilo or less than 2.2 pounds. So low birth weight may be attributable to a shortened period of gestation, prematurity, or restricted intrauterine growth rate. So looking at gestation, so gestation is the period of time from conception until birth. And so term infants Right, right, they're fully cooked between 37 and 42 weeks gestation. So preterm infants or prematurity is born anything before 37 weeks of gestation. And so a post-term infant is anything born after 42 weeks of gestation. Now a couple other definitions. So we have small for gestational age. So this is an infant with a birth weight less than the 10th percentile. So again, remember we had those that remember we talked about obesity and being overweight and looking at percentile charts. So here now we're looking at so small for gestational age is a 10th percentile. We have asymmetrical intrauterine growth restriction. And so this is an infant with normal length and head circumference measures, but their weight is less than the 10th percentile. So again, all the other measures are normal except for weight. Symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction is the infant with weight, length, and head circumference are all less than the 10th percentile. We then have basically the middle category, which is appropriate for gestational age. So that's somewhere between the 10th and 90th percentile. And then large for gestational age is a birth weight greater than the 90th percentile. And so here you can see the chart. And in essence, right at the extremes, we have babies too small baby's too big, and then 80% of babies right, are, right, are going to be in the middle, which is just normal. So most nutrients are deposited during the last three months of gestation, and therefore premature infants begin life in a compromised state of nutrition. So the big thing, right, is during the last three months, right, during the very end of the trimester is really when the baby's going to be building up its stores of nutrients and energy. And so fat constitutes 1% of the total body weight in a preterm infant weighing one kilo, compared to a term infant weighing 3.5 kilos, which is gonna have 16% of its total body weight. So you can imagine, right, it's a significant amount of energy storage difference. So preterm infants will rapidly run out of fat and carbohydrate fuels unless they receive adequate nutrition support. And so parental nutrition is initiated immediately for very low birth weight infants. So here we can see, so this is an example, right, of a very low birth weight infant. So this is 870 grams or one pound and 14 ounces. So again, this is at 27 weeks. So this is 10 weeks early. And so again, this is an example. And I think the biggest thing is if you have not been to a NICU or seen, um, basically the entire world or the entire medical world is zoomed in. So um, the tubes are smaller, the sensors are smaller, like everything is happening on a extremely smaller scale. Um, but we're still doing the same measures, right? We're still doing oxygen, we're doing nutrition support, etc. So common problems for premature infants include respiratory symptoms, such as respiratory distress syndrome, chronic lung disease, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or a lack of surfactant, cardiovascular issues, including patent ductus arteriosus, renal issues, including fluid and electrolyte shifts, neurological issues, including intraventricular hemorrhage, metabolic issues such as hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, hypocalcemia, and metabolic acidosis, GI issues such as hyperbilirubinemia, 
feeding intolerance and necrotizing enterocolitis, hematological issues such as anemia, immunological issues such as sepsis, pneumonia, or meningitis, and other assorted conditions including bradycardia, apnea, cyanosis, and osteopenia. So premature infants may have difficulty progressing to full enteral feeds in the first several days or weeks of life due to a small stomach capacity, immature GI tract, and possible illness. Parental nutrition becomes essential either as a full nutrition support or in addition to enteral nutrition, but it is important to initiate enteral nutrition as soon as possible to stimulate GI enzymatic development and activity, promote bile flow, increase villous growth in the small intestine, and promote mature GI motility. For fluid needs, again, we're concerned with inadequate fluids leading to dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, and hypotension, but excessive fluids can lead to edema, congestive heart failure, and the opening of ductus arteriosus. So again, we have to, we're having to thread the needle of we need the exact right amount. So large amounts of insensible water loss due to large surface area relative to small body weight. And so we do use hum humidified incubators and thermal blankets. So in essence, we want to make sure that they're not losing too much moisture through their skin. Usually fluids are administered at 80 to 105 milliliters per kilogram per day for the first day of life to meet insensible losses. And by the end of the second week, fluid needs reach 140 to 160 milliliters per kilogram per day. Now, a lot of these numbers I'm going to be telling you, um, it's more of an FYI. Um, I can tell you from my experience in the NICU is that um, those doctors are very well informed about TPN. Um, they're very good about managing them. Um, they're happy to teach and they'll go through things with you, um, but not in a mean way, but they're not really there to listen to your opinion. Um, right, so, so NICU doctors are a little bit of a different breed. Um, they're very involved in their patient care and they're extremely knowledgeable about this very specific area of care. So they're happy to teach, um, but I, this should be obvious. I wouldn't do this on any unit, right? But I would not walk in acting like I knew more about nutrition than the doctor but especially right, when it comes to this patient population, um, they're incredibly well-trained and familiar with these treatments. Um, but again, this kind of just puts you on a level playing field of at least having some idea of what they'll be doing and why they're doing it. So our energy needs, approximately 30 to 50 calories per kilogram for the first three days of life. You'll notice that again, compared to infancy, right, and compared to a child born at a normal gestation, You'll notice that this is a significantly lower calories in the first three days. But then again, we're going to gradually increase to 90 to 100 calories per kilogram, which is much more similar to a child born term. So glucose tolerance is limited due to inadequate insulin production, insulin resistance, and continued hepatic glucose release in addition to the IV glucose. And so hyperglycemia is better controlled if the glucose is also given alongside amino acids. So we would like to see their parental nutrition regimen also containing amino acids. Here you can see, so for example, remember this is the glucose infusion rate or glucose oxidation rate, or in the text they refer to it as glucose load. So again, remember that the maximum for adults was five milligrams per kilogram per minute. And here you'll see that they recommend for premature infants, four to six is the minimum, that's the initial, with a daily increase of one to two, and a maximum of 11 to 12 milligrams per kilograms per minute. For amino acids, approximately 1.5 to three grams per kilogram per day, although the guidelines do vary. So with the American Academy of Pediatrics recommending 2.7 to 3.5 grams per kilogram per day, and some extremely low birth weight infants may be even higher at 3.5 to 4 grams per kilogram per day. Again, this is more of an FYI or a discussion to have with the doctor, right, if you want them to teach you or you want to learn more about this very special patient population. Lipids, 1 to 2 grams per kilogram per day, advancing to 3 grams per kilogram per day. But premature infants have limited ability to produce carnitine. So carnitine is frequently added to parenteral nutrition to facilitate the mechanism by which fatty acids are transported across the mitochondrial membrane. So here we can see the guidelines for the parenteral nutrition amino acids. So again, you see the initial rate with again our maximum rate. And here we have our guidelines for lipids. Again, as we increase to three grams per kilogram per day as a maximum.
Here's some guidelines for electrolytes. Now again, I can tell you I don't adjust electrolytes in adult patients, and I would certainly never recommend to the doctor that we adjust electrolytes in a NICU patient. Um, again, this is more of just for reference in case you ever are trying to do this for a case study, etc. Again, here we have calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium recommendations. And here we have trace elements, including zinc, copper, manganese, selenium, chromium, molybdenum, and iodine. And so here you can see, so the recommendation for vitamins for a premature infant. And so again here, so you're going to see a reduced volume, but again, making sure that they are still getting all of the vitamins that they need. Again, if they were going to get enteral nutrition or formula, if they were a term infant, right? But in this case, they are going to be provided as part of the parenteral nutrition. So we're going to maintain parenteral nutrition until enteral nutrition is well established to maintain adequate net intake of fluid and nutrients. So this is definitely a patient population where we can't afford to pull the tube early and go, oops, um, never mind, we need to put it back. Again, we're on a much smaller scale than I think anything you've seen previously, where again, placing tubes in these patients is not an easy task. Again, so we do not remove tubes until we're absolutely certain it's okay to do so. So it may take seven to 14 days for very low birth weight infants to receive a full enteral feed. And the smallest, sickest infants, right, are gonna start at approximately 10 milliliters per kilogram per day. And larger, more stable preterm infants may tolerate 20 to 30 milliliters per kilogram per day. So looking at enteral nutrition, so again, if we're more stable and we're able to use enteral nutrition instead of parenteral nutrition, again, still 50 calories per kilogram for the first three days of life, gradually increasing to 105 to 130 calories per kilogram to support growth. And some preterm infants may need even more than 130 calories per kilogram. Now feedings may need to be concentrated to more than 24 calories per ounce due to limited ability to tolerate larger volumes. Now you should remember that the concentration of normal, of normal breast milk or normal formula is, you should remember is 20 calories per ounce. So again, we're looking at significantly more calories and caloric density for a patient population who needs the additional nutrients. Protein from enteral nutrition, approximately 3.5 to four grams per kilogram per day. Again, whey predominant formulas are most appropriate they're higher in cysteine, lower in phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And again, too much casein can irritate the GI tract, causing GI bleed and anemia. For lipids, approximately 40 to 50% of total calories. And so essential fatty acids are added to premature infant formulas since premature infants have less stores. Linoleic acid should, comp should compose 3% of total calories. ARA and DHA are added to the formula, again, similar to infant formula. And MCTs are more appropriate as the premature infant has low levels of pancreatic lipase and bile salts for fat digestion. Infants born before 28 to 34 weeks of gestation typically have low lactase activity. Again, remember that lactase is produced at the brush border by the intestinal cells, so we would need that GI tract to fully develop. So again, there's an increased likelihood that they will have lactose intolerance. Vitamins and minerals. So calcium and phosphorus are needed for optimal bone mineralization. Two thirds of a neonate's calcium and phosphorus is deposited during the last trimester. So if they're the more premature an infant is, the less likely right they are to have a full deposit of calcium and phosphorus in their bones. So they're at risk for osteopenia of prematurity. We're also going to monitor and might and likely need to supplement vitamins E, D, iron, folic acid, and sodium. Now you should remember that standard infant formula is 20 calories per ounce. So this goes with the previous lecture. So premature infants come ready to feed as 22, 24, and 30 calories per ounce. So you can imagine this is very similar to, I always imagine this is in my head, is very similar to when you're buying your gas, you've got your regular, your plus, and your premium. So do you need regular calories, some extra, a whole lot of extra, Right, and again, it just depends on the patient's needs. Now we told you that standard is 20. It also comes as 22, 24, and 30. But what about all those numbers in between? 
So I strongly recommend that you have this chart in your pocket guide out of all the charts that I would have. So again, what this shows is how we can actually get 26, 27, or 28 calories per ounce. And again, this would be prescribed by the physician. Now what you might have to do as the dietitian is that if this patient is going home, you're gonna have to teach their family how to mix it in these ratios. So it's very simple, right? This is a two to one, one to one, one to two, etc. So the ratios are not complicated, but again, when somebody has the stress of taking home a sick child, they're gonna be a full-time caregiver at home, right? You've gotta be patient and realize it may take them a little bit longer to kind of practice this, go through this and be comfortable with this before the patient's discharged. So infants less than 32 to 34 weeks gestation have difficulty coordinating suckling, swallowing, and breathing. And so again, it's kind of coordinating all of those activities safely and not aspirating. So we do have gastric gavage, so force feedings into the stomach via a syringe or pump. This can be nasal or oral. And so this is very similar to what we would call like an NG tube, um, but it's a little bit, it's technically a little bit different in the NICU patient, but it's essentially the same thing, right? Where we're going you know, to put the nutrition into the stomach so we don't have to worry about it getting into their lungs and causing any aspiration, pneumonia, etc. So feeding methods. So bolus feeds may be better than continuous because the milk fat, calcium, and phosphorus can deposit in a feeding tube. And so again, this may cause blockages. The child won't receive their full nutrition or the tube won't be functional. Again, when you're looking at the size of the tube, things that would be normally just residue or not be a big concern in a standard size tube, right? Again, th these are small on a scale. I just can't explain until you've seen one. Um, again, there's much more likelihood though that it could become clogged and ineffective. Transpyloric feeding, so indicated if aspiration risk or slow gastric emptying. And so again, this is very similar to those duodenal or jejunal tubes. And so here the feeding tube tip is gonna be placed in the duodenum or jejunum and confirmed with radiographic confirmation. Again, for children with severe GERD, aspiration risks, etc. Nipple feeding may be attempted when the child is older than 32 weeks gestation with, with evidence of established suckling reflex and sucking motion. Initially, though, we want to limit to one to three times per day to prevent undue fatigue and avoid stress to the infant. And so again, right, realizing that it's literally very difficult for the baby to get their nutrition, it requires a lot of strength. So again, we just want them to practice and work on the skill, but we don't expect premature infants this early on to be able to meet all of their needs orally. So for breastfeeding, so mom can express or pump the breast so that again, we can actually then into the tube that goes into the, st into the stomach or in the transpyloric feeds into the intestines, we can actually use breast milk. And then we also have, so what's known as kangaroo care, which again, we already know from outcomes and from studies that babies do better with skin to skin contact. So they actually show better thermoregulation, decreased mortality. So what we do is it's literally just hold the baby, which I know that sounds very common sense. Um, but in the NICU, right, this has kind of been a shift in that we can we have equipment that's portable enough. They don't have to just stay in the incubator and find a way to get this set up safely so that again, mom can bond with baby, baby gets skin to skin contact, baby has better outcomes, um, and actually recovers faster. So tolerance of enteral feeds. So again, if we're using that gastric gavage or if we're using that transpyloric feed, so we want to monitor for vomiting, abdominal distension, gastric residuals. So if there's any uh, blood or bilious uh, residuals. So if we see it when you um, flush or when you then check for residuals in the tube, make sure that it doesn't appear bloody or bilious. Any symptoms of reflux and then frequency and consistency of BM. So again, if there's any blood, mucus, etc. So selection of enteral feeds, so initially may need parenteral nutrition, again with the goal then transitioning to enteral feeds, and then again taking one to two weeks to establish tolerance. And for enteral nutrition we have several options. So we have human milk supplemented with human milk fortifiers, so again that's human milk that we then add additional nutrients and calories to to get to that concentrated calories per ounce. There's iron fortified premature infant formula for infants less than two kilograms, and iron fortified standard infant formula if the infant is over two kilograms. So we've talked about this previously. So human milk is the ideal food for term and premature infants. 
does require supplementation, though, to meet the needs of premature infants. So mom's body will adjust, but it can only adjust so much. So milk from mothers of premature infants is higher in protein and sodium, and infants will grow faster with this milk compared to mature human milk. So mom's body will actually adjust and do as much as it can. Um, in essence, we're just taking that same process and kind of helping. So zinc and iron are more readily absorbed from breast milk, and fat is more easily digested because of the presence of lipases. So human milk compared with premature infant formula, so fed to preterm infants, so we have a study from CISC et al. So it reduces the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis and sepsis. So again, we're looking at so GI diseases and infections, improves neurodevelopment, facilitates a more rapid advancement of enteral feeds, and leads to an earlier discharge. However, human milk does not meet the calcium and phosphorus needs of preterm infants. So again, it improves sodium and protein, but again, the human body can only do so much. So again, we just supplement these micronutrients to kind of boost the process along. So here you have so human milk fortifiers. And so these can be powder bovine milk base, liquid bovine milk base, or liquid donor human milk base. And so again, this is where things like the milk bank come in to play. Um, but in essence, they look, a lot of what they look like is very similar to like a large crystal light stick. Um, and so what they're done is they provide additional calories and nutrients to when you prepare them with human milk. And so here you can see, again, the biggest focus is we need a little bit of extra calories, but the big thing is, is that micronutrient profile. So again, we know that mom's body helps out with protein and sodium. And again, we're kind of just helping it along with the rest of the micronutrients, right, the vitamins and minerals. So again, looking at transitional formulas. So again, we said standard was 20. We said then preterms had 22, 24, and 30, and could be custom mixed for other needs. So 22 calories per ounce is, des is designed as a transition formula for the premature infant. And this can be introduced when the infant reaches 2,000 grams or more. So again, 2,000 grams or two kilograms. So it's basically 4.4 pounds or right, just shy of five pounds. So this can be used for the first year of life. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends to continue transitional formula until the infant's weight for length is above the 25th percentile. So in essence, we keep giving extra calories until they've caught up to at least the 25th percentile. So how do we concentrate formulas? So we can prepare the formula with less water, but we have to consider the renal solute load and the fluid needs. So again, that higher protein content. Now there is a difference, right? So infant formula powder is clean, but it's not sterile. So the highest risk infants, right? This really isn't the best choice. And then there are additional additives. So we can reach 26, 27, 28, or 30 calories per ounce. So we can either change the ratio or the dilution of the formula, or we can actually add modulars to change the density and the nutrient composition of these formulas. Now, again, this is, I'm not going to ask you to do any of this math. So this is a very specialized skill. But again, if this becomes your area of practice, you would work on this. You would train under a dietitian. You would be you would train and work with a physician. But again, you would basically be teaching families how to do this and how to prepare this. So again, we remember we've said that pure dextrose is actually 3.4 calories per gram, and lipids in TPN are 10 calories per gram. Well, here now again, right? We're looking at some slightly different numbers. For an adult, would this make a difference? Not really. For a two pound baby, does this make a difference? You betcha, right? So now we have to be much more precise. We're kind of, you know, getting to the microscopic level. So MCT oils are 7.7 .7 calories per milliliter. So these can be used for patients with fat malabsorption, but these should be bolused and not run continuously. Microlipid has 4.5 calories per milliliter. This can be used for continuous feeds, but it's very expensive and requires refrigeration. Corn oil contains eight calories per milliliter. So this can be used with bottles or bolus feeds and should not be run continuously. Again, can be used with respiratory compromise, but because of the fat concentration may delay gastric emptying. k -row syrup. Again, we don't want to use this until over six months of age. Again, four calories per milliliter but there's actually other options. But again, you also have to look at costs, right? So these infants also have very, very high costs of care. Again, so getting some of this stuff drop shipped to your house or prescribed. So 
Again, we have solutions. We always have, we may have better solutions, but we have to work with what we've got. So polycose has eight calories per milliliter, and this is used for reflux and dysphagia. Um, but again, because of the higher carbohydrates, beware of the high osmolar load. And then we have ProMod and other protein supplements. And so these are 5.5 calories to the gram um, or so. Uh, so we have uh, one gram of protein per teaspoon. And again, here's how we can use as a modular. We can increase the protein content specifically of an enteral nutrition regimen for a premature infant. Now, again, this is just one example. This will be customized based on every patient's needs, based on a review of their lab work, their weight, how fast they've been weaning, their GI tolerance. Like there's a there's a lot that goes into making these decisions. This is just to illustrate an example. So let's say we wanted 30 calories per ounce from liquid concentrate. So we're starting with standard formula. I know what you're saying. I can just go out and buy 30 calorie per ounce formula. You could, but it won't have the exact composition of this. So what we would do is we would mix 13 ounces of concentrate with seven ounces of water. So again, this would give us 26 calories per ounce as our base. We would add two tablespoons of polycose, which gets us to 28 calories per ounce because we've actually dissolved the polycose into the liquid. And then adding six mils of MCT oil to further increase it to 30 calories per ounce. And so again, this would have the right ratio of carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And again, this would be different for every single patient. So this is just to illustrate an example. I'm not expecting you to be able to do this math. I'm just kind of explaining to you what you would have to do if this became your area of practice and expertise is being able to teach the family, you know, two scoops of this, one small measuring spoon of this, one of this, and you have to prepare it this way at this time of day, at this frequency, right? That's kind of your big role in working with these patient families. So things we're going to monitor for these patients. So we're going to monitor intake, lab values, including fluid and electrolyte shifts, parenteral or enteral nutrition tolerance. We want to look at their bone mineralization. So again, we know they were already born behind the curve with that bone mineralization. So we want to make sure that they're getting adequate nutrients and that this process is occurring. And hematological status, again, ensuring that we're monitoring for anemia, growth rates, and growth charts. Now what we have is what's known as the Aaron Kronz growth chart. And so this is used to assess weight progress for the first 98 days of life for the premature infant. And so during the first week of life, so premature infants decline from their birth weight. After initial weight loss, a weight gain of 15 grams per kilogram per day can be achieved. And so regular CDC growth charts can be used after an infant reaches 40 weeks gestation, as long as we, as long as we use the age adjustment. So here you can see the Aaron Kronz growth chart. So this goes up to 98 days. And again, this kind of tells us, so based on our starting point, right, we, we can then kind of see how these babies are going to grow and mature. So here we have the steps for adjusting age for prematurity on growth charts. Um, and they've, they've basically made this really complicated for something that's really simple. So you just take 40 weeks, minus the weeks the child was born and that becomes your correction factor so 40 weeks if the baby in this example is born at 28 weeks they're 12 weeks early so then whenever you measure the baby you just subtract 12 weeks and so what i mean by that is you would check on the growth chart and so the growth chart says this is your baby at 10 weeks or well, that's too that's too early let's say this is your baby at 20 weeks but your baby is actually 12 weeks early. So 20, so you put them on the chart at 20 weeks, but they're born 12 weeks early, they're actually a quote unquote an eight week old baby. And so what we wanna do is even though they've been outside of mom's body for 12 weeks, they should only be the same size had they been out of mom's body for eight weeks. So we wanna compare them to other eight week old babies. You can't compare a baby that, you know, is born 12 weeks early and so now all of a sudden they're, they're you know, 12 weeks old and expect them to look like a 12 week old baby who spent an extra 12 weeks in mom's body, right? That just doesn't make sense. So you just use that correction factor to then kind of even the playing field when comparing where they should be on their growth. So you can see on this chart, right, what you're actually seeing is so, since this child was born premature, you can see that they're actually below the fifth percentile, right? They look very, very undersized, but we're going to provide them with additional calories for catch-up growth, 
And then you can actually see, right, as they actually get back on the curve and get fairly well into the curve, they're not quite at the 25th percentile. But again, this is what we want to see, which is off the curve and then slowly climbing back on with that sped up growth and those additional nutrients. And that's what this one illustrates as well. So prior to discharge, preterm infants need to be able to tolerate their feeds, either by breast or by bottle. They may be allowed to go home with, with gastric gavage feedings. Um, again, it depends on the situation. We want to be showing that they're growing adequately with a feeding schedule that's being well followed. They're able to maintain their body temperature without the help of an incubator. And usually our weight cutoff is five pounds, although this technically varies between facilities. The biggest thing, again, so we said was lots of education from the RD, is parents must be ready to care for their infant. So again, they have to be able to provide feedings and meds safely. So again, our biggest thing is on feeding schedule and how to prepare the formula. And again, from a support standpoint, so the dietitian works with the social worker to help parents obtain formula and additives through their pharmacy, Medicaid, or WIC. So again, the biggest thing here is that, okay, you know how to mix it, but this isn't stuff you can just go and buy at Publix. So like a lot of this has to be either shipped to Walgreens or through Walgreens or drop shipped to your house from a company. How is that set up? How is that arranged through insurance, right? Again, a lot of stress for parents that are already taking care of a premature infant. So again, the dietitian works with the social worker to help kind of set that up. Um, so home visits by nursing and dietitians aren't uncommon to again, make sure that adjustment is going well, continuing to follow the regimen at home. And then follow up appointments again with the pediatrician, dietitian and speech therapist, and possibly other specialties such as cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, and feeding specialists. So looking at survival rates of premature infants. So survival rates at 23 weeks is a 17% chance of survival. At 24 weeks, 39%. And at 25 weeks, 50%. And from 32 weeks onwards, most babies are able to survive with medical treatment. Um, and so again, so sometimes, right, prematurity is unplanned, so it's an emergency. Sometimes, right, because of preeclampsia, right, we know that Basically, mom's health is in jeopardy, so the babies have to be delivered early. Um, but again, what we're going to do is have to balance these medical decisions out, right? And so the doctor is going to speak with the, right, in this case, the mom is the patient before then the baby becomes the patient. But again, right, so we go up 11%. So from 23 to 24 weeks, we're going to go up 22%, which is a huge jump. So if it's safe enough for mom, can we go another week? And then we go from 24 to 25, we go up another 11%. Again, if it's safe enough, what can we do? And so, you know, there actually are treatments. So for example, if we're, if we're kind of knowing this is going to happen, right, we may provide mom with steroids, which actually improves uh, the baby's lung development, et cetera. So again, our science, we've gotten a lot better about this, right? So protecting mom and baby to get the best possible outcomes. So neurodevelopmental outcome. So one in premature babies will develop a permanent disability such as lung disease, cerebral palsy, blindness, or deafness. And so if children be born before 26 weeks gestation results in 241 of the surviving children at six years indicate a high level of disability with the following breakdown. So 22% had a severe disability such as cerebral palsy but not walking, low cognitive scores, blindness or profound deafness. 24% had moderate disability to find a cerebral palsy but walking, IQ and cognitive scores in the special needs range and a lesser degree of visual or hearing impairment. 34% a mild disability defined as a low IQ or cognitive score, squinting or requiring glasses, and 20% reported no problems. Uh, so when you look at these outcomes, and so sometimes you go, well, those outcomes don't seem so good, or maybe they seem concerning. So again, you kind of look at the way stats are affected. So what we have is you, you saw the number of children and the percentage of children that had some kind of developmental problem. But part of the reason for that is because we have increased survival rates of extremely low birth weight infants. So, so more children live, which is the end goal, right? That's the important thing, more children live. But because more children live, and especially because more of the very sick children live, there's an increase in the number of children who may have developmental disabilities, but, there's also an increase in the number of children who have no developmental difficulties. So 
uh, again, you just have to kind of understand the stats. And again, don't don't be scared of the numbers, right? This is a good thing, right? Because what we're having is a better survival rate across the board. And so many of these premature infants reach adulthood with no evidence of any disability. So, so that's good. Like I said, within the last 50 years, we have become extremely good at treating premature infants. Um, again, science, science and technology has advanced rapidly, allowing us and giving us the tools that we need to work with and treat these patients. All right, so let's take a look at some practice questions. So the most important substance secreted by alveolar cells in the alveoli and respiratory air passages that is lacking in premature infants. So again, we discussed this briefly in this lecture, and this is a bit of a review from the respiratory lecture. And so this is answer choice B, surfactant. An infant that weighs 1,250 grams at birth would be considered, and this is answer choice, so this is above 1,000 grams, so this is answer choice B, very low birth weight. Energy requirements of preterm infants fed parenterally are, and so this answer was not explicitly discussed, um, I just kind of gave you the numbers, and then you were supposed to kind of realize the numbers were different. And so that is answer choice A, less than those fed enterally. So you saw, right, again, you saw the 120s and 130s versus the 100. Part of this is, right, you don't have to worry about digestion and absorption with parenteral nutrition. Number four, compared with breast milk produced by mothers of term infants, Breast milk produced by mothers of preterm infants is, and this is answer choice A, higher in protein and sodium. So remember, mom's body makes some adjustments. It couldn't adjust for the calcium and the phosphorus, but it does increase in protein and sodium. And number five, so preterm infants who are fed breast milk without fortifiers or regular infant formula. And so again, this is more of a, an analysis question. So they're going to be more likely to develop. And so this is answer choice D, osteopenia of prematurity. So again, because mom's body doesn't adjust for the calcium and phosphorus without supplements, they're an increased risk for developing this form of osteopenia. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions in our discussion.